Uh, we didn't get to talk to you after the game, but um, Jarvis, you know, just kind of him going through the, the highs and lows of missing an opportunity and then coming back. And how, how, how far has he come um, since you guys have been here? Um, he's come far. You know, I still think there's a lot left there. Um, but I think we've seen glimpses, even up last year, we've seen glimpses of his ability to cover people, tackle. He's actually a really good blitzer, too, you know, and we've seen lapses in his game. Um, I think the message from us is pretty consistent with him, and it is for every player, not just Jarvis. He happens to play corner, so that's the one that the spotlight gets on sometimes. But, you know, your Sunday through Friday preparation will equal Saturday, and I think he's seen the fruits of that labor the last several weeks, and that's got to continue for him. Jamie Robinson has the pick in the in the red zone, uh, and he's been playing that safety role a little bit more. It seems like how, how's he coming along there, and what has that done for you guys defensively for him to kind of get stabilized in that position? Well, we knew when we recruited Jamie that he was going to have multiple skill sets that we could be able to use him. It just happened to be how quickly his development came within the defense, you know, how smart he can play, but also the people around him and where we can fit guys in. So, obviously. The development of Kevin Knowles has helped that, you know, and that's offset the ability to be able to get Jamie back there. Um, but also having Pac, um, Jack Wes McCauley, and he's helped us be able to develop some Jamie at safety too. But, you know, that was a big play. And, you know, when you're playing guys at multiple positions, I think the trick as a coach that I'm constantly asking Jamie, the other guys that play multiple positions are, are you getting the reps that you need to get to feel comfortable with the game plan at that position? You know, because that red zone route is something we practiced. And Jamie practices at nickel, and he practices at safety, and then it happens, you know. But I, I wish that could happen all the time. I just there's going to be certain plays that you're going to run. He may not get it at a certain spot, but you're trying to go over the, and then you just got to make sure he's seen it enough in film that he can react in a way that um, that could happen. But that was a rep that we had repped in practice. He saw it, he and he made the most of it. You were able to empty the bench at the end there. How much did that help some of those young guys to get that experience? And what did you see from those young guys? You know, as much as you say practice is everything, you know, there's still a feeling of going out there on game day and, and suiting up and play. You know, so I think we played 14 D linemen, 14 DBs. Um, could be off a number here and there, but I mean, a good a number of people. Um, so I think that just helps those guys. You know, yesterday on Sunday, you know, they had a taste of it, so they come back out and, you know, I. I I think the ones that get in deserve to get in, and you know, hopefully that helps their development even expedite a little bit quicker just because they, they got a chance to get out there on the grass for us on, on Saturday on a game day. Yeah, er, early this season, it might have been in preseason camp, um, Coach Norvell made a comment about Jared Jackson maybe being an X factor, a guy that could could help out. And, and you, obviously, you guys have been challenged a little bit from a depth standpoint. How how far, ha, how well has he done? And, and is he a guy that you guys feel like you can count on now? Jared is extremely physically gifted. Um, you saw him on one of the plays. They lined up in a unique formation that didn't become too unique Saturday. Um, but, you know, he played the dive, the quarterback, and the throw all in one play. You know, he's just so big and athletic um, that I think he's really got a chance to come into his own. I think the development of Fabian and, and the other defensive linemen around him have, have helped him. Um, it's just the consistency that he needs throughout the week of the toughness and the grit that it takes to play that position. And at times he's shown that. Um, and, you know, he, he had probably one of us, our highest production games as a defensive tackle this year per play, you know, just with his production that he had last week. So, you know, we don't, when he's in the game, you know, it's not something that we regret or have any, like we think he is a legitimate playmaker in there. It's just doing it for a higher play count is what we're challenging him to do. I know Duke was uh, a young guy, but got in earlier, and, and, he, and you guys are trying to get him in there. How did he do? I, it looked like maybe one play he kind of got washed out a little bit, but 
How did he do overall? No, he definitely he lost the edge on one of them. But you know, Duke's somebody that you know we made a decision to play him you know several weeks ago, and so we're committed to that. Not because we're forcing it, but because he deserves it. He's one of our you know top corners, and so he's going to rotate throughout the game. We don't question when it's going to be. I don't tell Coach Wood to make sure you let me know when he's in. Like I've got a feel for the rotation with him and. Uh, you know, he's shown really consistent performance throughout practices. His ability to compete, his coverage skills, um, you know, he's ready for it. You know, so he, he deserves all these reps that he's getting. Come back over here to Brendan. It seems like the last couple of games, and please correct me if I'm wrong, it seems like the, you guys haven't allowed big plays to compound. Like maybe there's one, but it doesn't lead to two or three. Uh, what, what has shift, if that's so, what has shifted with that? Uh, how are you guys? doing a better job of not letting big plays snowball like that? Yeah, I think it's just it's the building of the confidence and the mentality. You know, when we say, give us a place to stand. You know, if the ball breaks, get it down and give us a chance to play red zone defense um, and, and use that area of the field as a strength for ours. And, you know, I think we've started to develop that mindset um, both just mentally but also schematically uh, to be able to play good red zone defense. I think that's critical. Um, you know, Listen, we've said before, the goal is to keep points off the board. You know, so you, if you don't give up big plays and you play good red zone defense, that usually adds up well. And, um, you know, that's been showing up the last couple of weeks, but definitely got to continue. No, the Clemson offense hasn't been what was expected of them, but what are the challenges they present and what is it that they are capable of doing that maybe they haven't done to this point in time this year? Well, I mean, if you go back and you look at the guys they've recruited and developed, I mean, they've got a track record of, championship level football you know so you know overnight they just didn't you know not have good players or you know so for whatever the reason you know we're getting into it now um, but I mean they've got top level players at all positions and um, you know we're studying it now making sure that we can get ourselves in position to take advantage of our opportunity um, come next Saturday going there I know that's a difficult place to play um, you know they're still a really good football team um, and you know, they've got players in that team that have had a lot of success. And so that'll be a, a major challenge to go to go up there and, and go play our best. Uh, I know they briefly benched their starting quarterback, but he came back for the end of the game Saturday. Dabo said last night that I think he this week would dictate which of them would start, I guess. Does, does it change anything, whether it's DJ or Tyson Fomachon out there? Uh, I mean, it changes because it's a different person, you know. So, you know, the quarterback's the one that gets the attention, right? You know, so... you. It's always going to be there, but I mean, I've coached long enough that you're you're going to study whether the backups play a lot or not. That he's played just gives you more tape to study. Um, but we'll have a game plan for whoever's going to be in there, and um, you know, take it from there. A little more specifically, they they've got some skilled guys that are as good as anybody in the country at a tight end, the receiver. Um, how much of a challenge does that put on the defense? Yeah, I think any time you can have that combination, I mean, two good wideouts are really hard, right? You put a tight end in the middle of a formation in a wideout, you know, there's only, there's so much space that you can align guys to lean places. And, you know, there inevitably are going to be one-on-ones in, in a game like this. And, um, you know, the technique and the focus um, are going to be important to make sure that we're playing with the right leverages and we're able to take advantage on our side of the one-on-ones. Um, but, you know, They've always been traditionally a team that's created balance, right? They've, they've had quarterback runs that have kept you honest. Now you have over-the-top throws, but you're creating safety help for the quarterback runs. And, you know, they've had running backs that can win one-on-ones, wideouts. Um, they've been really good up front. And so it's just – it's been the combination of that program, you know, just as a team, you know, offensively doing what they need to do to move the ball in multiple ways. And, you know, their defense has been obviously one of the top defenses in the country for many years. So um, I think it's a collection of all of it, going back to the tight end wide out. I mean, they're really good players. But I think that when you put somebody in the core and somebody removed from the core, it just stretches your defense that much more. You know, I think, you know, that's something that obviously they want to try to take advantage of. Yeah, also, from a confidence standpoint, um, how do you feel like your guys have not got through some of the early struggles and, and some of the things that that didn't go well? And and you know, what do you think was the key to kind of getting through that to where you guys are now? Consistent message. You know, I think you know at any point when 
you lose a game on the last second field goal or a last play and you know you show up the next day and the message is consistent um, the leadership is consistent um, how we act as coaches how the top players react to the coaching I think from coach storms to our training room to coach Norvell to myself to the position coaches you know I think that's allowed our players to gain confidence in the process of improvement you know and it's it's the only tricky part about that is that it's got to be authentic and it's hard, right? Anytime you get punched in the jaw and you got to wake up and show up again and be even better, I mean, that's not easy for people. Um, but that's why, you know, you put a staff together like the one Coach Norvell has put together and you wake up every day and you go to work regardless of the pat on the back or the push from the front. And you just keep, you keep at it. I know it's, you always want to start off early, but with an offense that has talent but has been struggling, how important is it to maybe not give them some early confidence and get them feeling good about themselves? Uh, and does it, does it feel any different than any game in that regard? Because, like I said, you always want to start off well and play well the whole time. Yeah. I, I mean, we're going to try to stop them early. Yes. <laughs> I'm with, that's it. You know what? We will now break. Um, but, yeah, I mean, there's, there's some human nature to this whole thing, right? Like, everybody's always saying, hey, it's so critical in this game to start fast because of X, Y, and Z. The weather, their momentum, our moment, whatever all that is. Um, you know, and that goes into play a little bit, but – you know, it, it's hard. I mean, you know, you make a decision to take the ball, kick the ball, you know, all those things you take into consideration. Um, schematically, you know, how you deal with that is obviously there's, there's times you can be more aggressive or times when you're playing defense, you're like, you know what, we don't want to screw this up. You know, make them make the play, you know, right? And so there's always that thought process that I think I can help answer that question. Like when you're calling offense or defense that when you feel like your kids are playing with good confidence, and you don't feel like you need to interrupt the game to make a play for them. As opposed to sometimes you're like, all right, we got to take a chance here, or we got to do this to add a spark. I think that could answer your question is from my seat of how you try to inject yourself into the game or try to remove yourself from the game. Uh, I think as a coach, as much as you can, you're trying to remove yourself as much as possible. From a standpoint of you're letting the players play, you're trying to create feedback, you're trying to get the right information from the right players so that you can keep the momentum or the flow in the game in a way that they feel super confident and comfortable with it. Um, there's been times that I've called defense in a way that, you know, it might not be the perfect call, but it's the best call for that situation with our players right now because of their belief in it. Um, as opposed to throwing them a curveball in the middle of a series, it may schematically be a great decision, and you can sit down in front of you guys and say, oh, yeah, this makes sense because we did it like this. But from a player standpoint, if the comfortability wasn't with it or you know, their comfortability with their players that they're playing against, you know, so all that stuff goes into it. All right, last one. We'll go to Aslan in the back right. Coach, you've put so many people in the back end of your defense, but you kind of settle on who are going to be your, the five guys you're going to count on. Watching the TV copy, there's guys that started games that are no longer getting in games, but they're, they're staying engaged, they're cheering on their teammates. It'd be so easy, I guess, for a guy to be a distraction or put their name in the portal. I mean, what does it speak to? Is it the individual character of those guys staying engaged, or is it the overall sort of team policing that's keeping everybody kind of positive and, and rooting each other on? You know, probably a little bit of both. You know, I think I, we always try to make the individual is always going to be in the front of my mind but it's gotta be team first, right? So, you know, individual recognition comes with team success. That traditionally happens. Um, but, you know, you have individual conversations and you're gonna make decisions based off of individual needs sometimes or, you know, direction of kids. But at the end of the day, it's gotta be with the team first mentality, uh, with how we act and how we make the decisions. And I think going back to Ira's question, I think how we make those decisions and how we react as coaches filter through to the players. And um, is it always perfect? No, but it's definitely something that we try to, we understand the weight of our actions, the weight of our words, and how that affects the individual, uh, and more importantly, the entire team. All right. Thank you, Coach. Thanks, guys. Welcome back, Corey.